Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Grad on Aspire once again. Uh, where we have a number of exciting career initiatives lined up, including webinars happening every day throughout the 24th to the 27th of October. Do check out our website for the full schedule. Um, today, we're going to be talking about something very relevant, something that has hit us um, quite suddenly uh, earlier on the year, uh, but it has hit us hard. Um, it's a big question that everyone always wants to know, will the workplace ever be the same again? So 2020 will always be remembered as the year where you know, things changed from the norm, like basically meetings have now become virtual meetings. Even Gradon Aspire used to be something physical for 10 years, and then now we're doing it virtually. Um, it has also introduced new roles and opportunities. So it's not all bad. There's a lot of good that has come with change. Um, but it has shook up for many industries as well and we wanted to discuss with our panelists today whether these changes will remain or what can we look forward to you know, as we move ahead. So we are privileged to have um, Iskandar Shah Zukanain, who is the Group Chief Human Resource Officer of Bank Islam, Cameron McDonald, Head of Resourcing and Onboarding, HSBC Singapore and Malaysia, Hi. Uh, we have Chen Fong Tuan, Country HR and General Affairs Director from Samsung Malaysia, and also Lai Tak Ming, Executive Director, Country Head of Human Resources, COB Malaysia. Hi. Um, um, so, for those tuning in, do keep sending your questions in the chat box. There's a chat box on the other side so that you know, we can we'll go into the thick of the forum, and then after that, we'll answer some Q&As, hopefully. Um, in the meantime, also do follow us on our social media channels so that you can keep up to date about our latest happenings. Um, before we get started, I'm going to ask our dear panelists to introduce themselves a bit and tell us uh, more about what they do in their organizations. Um, Iskandar, maybe you can start off? Sure. Hi, Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Iskandar here from uh, Bank Islam. Uh, I lead the HR team. Uh, one year with the bank. Uh, very happy to be here. And um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to this uh, discussion today. Um, Cameron? Um... Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I'm Cameron McDonald. I'm from Canada, but I've been here in Singapore, supporting Singapore and Malaysia with HSBC for about the last two years. And I'm the head of the resourcing and onboarding team. Um, FT. Hi everyone, thank you for inviting us uh, and happy to be here. Looking forward to a fruitful discussion today. Uh, you can call me FT, I'm the uh, HR Director for Samsung Malaysia Electronics. I've been here for coming to two years. Uh, I'm an engineer by training. Uh, I feel a bit out of place because I'm uh, in the presence of uh, three bankers, uh, but rest be assured, I'm an ex-banker. Uh, so probably that qualifies me to be on the panel as well. Looks like all the bankers are taking over. Um, so, uh, tell me. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm also one of those who are working in the bank. My name is Lai Tak Ming. You can call me Tak Ming. Uh, I have been uh, involved with Graduate for some time now, for some, some years. Uh, before this, I was Mr. Gamuda uh, in an engineering company. But uh, today is uh, the bank, United Overseas Bank. Uh, like Fong Tuan, I'm a uh, science graduate. I actually a uh, physics gradu graduate. Uh, my first degree was in uh, physics and mathematics. And uh, don't ask me why in the world I ended up in HR. Uh, but today I'm in HR. And uh, i like to also qualify that I am an unashamed Arsenal supporter. So yeah. any of you out there who is an Arsenal supporter, please PM me and you will get a job. If you're not an Arsenal supporter, sorry, don't bother to write to me. <laughs> Well, it's nice to have a bit of a diverse background, even though a lot of you are from the banks. I'm sure that would give us a bit of a, you know, different insights to today's topic. So I'm going to start right with uh, Tak Ming. Since, um, you know, what do you think, in your opinion, has been the biggest change in the workplace for this year? Oh, I guess <laughs> the whole problem with COVID-19, uh, uh, because of COVID-19, we the as you probably know, banks are not always the most uh, progressive when it comes to technology. We we are always a little bit uh, slow to catch up. 
unlike people like Samsung, they are they are a lot more techy. You know, we we struggle with the whole question of technology from the point of view that uh, perhaps there's too much regulatory controls and things like that. So it takes a while for us to get ourselves up to speed. And uh, so when COVID nineteen hit us, uh, thankfully, thankfully in the case of UOB, we we were just embarking on a uh, re uh, what you call tech tech upgrade program, and where we were trying to get everybody back uh, uh, to be as much as possible on laptops. And that started sometime last year. And so because of that, uh, we, we were able to actually uh, uh, move people to work from home uh, very soon after the MCO started. Uh, if not for the fact that we have started that journey, we will have something like 15% of our workforce who holds laptop and the remaining 85% who are actually on laptop, which, uh, on desktop, which means that you, you just can't work from home. So uh, that that uh, program actually gave us a head start in that sense. Uh, and of course, very quickly, we tried to transform and move as many people as possible uh, to uh, working from home and also virtual uh, communications and so on and so on. And I think the biggest change in the last six to eight months is that today we have certainly become very much more conversant, even though we are not uh, what you call digital native. Many of us are in the older generation. But the whole ad advent of technology has now become part of us. We've gotten used to the become what we call digital users, not necessarily digital natives. You're on mute. Nada, you're on you're mute. mute Sorry. Okay. Um, FT, I wanted to ask your opinion about this because according to Tat Ming, you know, he had to do a lot of transformation for his organization. Whereas for something, you know, like Samsung, it's very, very technologically advanced. Um, did you feel anything? What was the biggest change for you? I think COVID has offended everyone and everything. Uh, and certainly work, the workplace is one of them. Um, interestingly, uh, that mean, what Daming said is correct. Uh, not that banking is behind. I don't think banking is behind. <laughs> I think it, uh, is just being, you know, very, very... Uh, rather humble in saying that, you know, it is yeah. <laughs> but someone is a bit fortunate because uh, from the 18th, uh, the 16th of March, uh, we had two days, 48 hours to move mm -hmm. into total uh, lockdown within two days. Uh, so we were very fortunate because 100% uh, of our workforce were already on mobile. Technically, we are a mobile company. So uh, my challenge is not actually the infra. My challenge is the mindset. Um, Samsung is a multinational, but we are still very Asian. And Asian likes to meet. Uh, we like to meet all the time. Uh, every meeting needs to be face-to-face. -face. Everything needs to be uh, discussed. Everything needs to be socialized. Um, now the socialization still happens, but the influencing is not done in the normal way. You just can't bring people up for a quick you know, chit-chat over uh, a cup of coffee. Uh, those things still need to be done, but how can you do it? virtually now. Uh, I couldn't agree more. We are a lot more conversant in the different tools, but we also need to upskill and upgrade ourselves in terms of capability when it comes to influencing across, strategizing and getting the inputs from multiple stakeholders uh, whilst not having the opportunity to interact face-to-face, -face. the opportunity to have organically meet each other and you know, a shake of hand and saying like, you know, okay, we agree on this. So these are totally new to us. Mm -hmm. Even for Samsung, it's totally new because we are very Asian still. Yeah. Uh, and I think the Asianness is holding some of us back. I'm sure if you ask Cameron later, because HSBC is a probably a good uh, you know, combination of both Asian and, and not so Asian. Um, so our challenge is the mindset. Uh, to get people out from having to do this face to face and moving people to totally virtual, totally uh, collaborative in a virtual space uh, has been a challenge. Yeah, um, Cameron, um, yes. share a bit about your input in this, especially since you're managing Singapore and Malaysia as well. Um, so you had the circuit breaker and then you had the MCO. I'm sure it was a lot for you. Very, to... yeah. It was interesting because they were happening at different times, so to speak, even though COVID was here, but the lockdowns and things were a bit different. So the biggest thing for us was we were fortunate as well from a technology perspective. We actually had invested in, in technology in the previous year. So we had things like Avature, 
Um, and, and then just from an onboarding perspective, that was probably the biggest challenge because all of a sudden on Friday, you find out that there's lockdown and we have people who are supposed to come to the office. So we actually moved quite quickly. I think we surprised ourselves how quickly we were able to get to a virtual onboarding. Um, whereas I think if had we actually planned it in a regular, regular world, it probably would have took us a lot longer to actually implement it. So in, in some ways, because of, because of COVID, we really had to, um, we just had to move faster. And I think we kind of surprised ourselves uh, in terms of how fast we, we could do the virtual onboarding. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest, the biggest things for us um, what was that component from an employee's perspective. You know, and we were all Zoom experts now. We all know how to, you know, I, I think the biggest challenge too is getting up and moving around, right? So we're Zoom meeting, Zoom meeting, Zoom meeting. Whereas before you'd get up and go to a meeting room and, you know, like you say, you'd have interactions. You would, so um, also being in Canada, work from home was much more, um, it was like I was working from home one to two days a week when I was in Canada, but I came here, still wasn't really adopted yet. Like in the whole, now half of my team doesn't even want to probably come to the office, you know, mm. instead of one or two days a week, um, they'll probably want to work from home or five days a week, right? So I think it just in terms of that change is probably, I don't think you're going to see the workforce coming back on, on a five day work week anymore. I just don't think that's going to happen. So, yeah. I mean, it has changed a lot of things in, in general. Um, like you mentioned onboarding and also the ways that companies sort of engage with new talents and also the public. So, you know, so Bank Islam actually worked together with Graduan to produce content digital content earlier on so that Bank Islam can continuously engage with talent throughout the pandemic. And that's something really digitally forward of, um, you know, Iskandar. And I just wanted to hear a bit from you as well about your thoughts about what's the biggest change for the workplace in, for this year. Okay, thanks, Nanda. Um, well, the world changed, right? And um, as a bank, uh, obviously, we have our BCP plans in place and the scenarios that we, we all plan for. Um, but this time it was real. Yeah, it, was, uh, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't a simulation that we had to role play for. So that was, that was quite um, interesting. I mean, it was a test of whether uh, our plans actually work, right? Um, and at the workplace, um, I think the physical spaces and the facilities are now somewhat uh, redundant, if I can describe it in that way. So for example, you know, we have training rooms that are empty, but we have a lot of trainings happening online, yeah. right? Um, yeah. We had a lot of um, meeting rooms, also empty, right? But a lot of meetings are happening, again, uh, online. Um, we have, uh, what? We have, we have seats. We have seats for every single person. Uh, but today, a portion of it um, uh, is empty because uh, many of them are also um, working remotely, uh, mainly from home. So work is now uh, virtual, just like uh, what uh, uh, my colleague Tak Ming has mentioned. Uh, you know, we had the initial, uh, you know, situation of having to catch up from a tech point of view, you know, the VPNs and the access and the security controls and, and what have you. But um, I think we quickly, um, you know, uh, we, we, we were able to quickly overcome all those. Uh, interestingly, you know, since um, March, uh, I think was it March? Yeah, since March, um, all our board meetings, uh, all our, you know, management meetings were all done virtually. We were a bit nervous, you know, having to run the bank, um, you know, completely virtual. We were not sure how our uh, more mature, uh, you know, senior board of directors would, would behave, um, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, interestingly, they were actually more um, uh, aggressive maybe with us <laughs> because they were very comfortable at home. They had time to read their papers and they were, you know, putting us uh, on the spot a lot more. So it, it worked out fine. Yeah? It, was, it was just as uh, effective. Um, so that, that ability to quickly, um, I don't know, reshuffle, uh, our steps uh, come up with uh, workarounds and, and uh, you know, this, the customers were also uh, requiring support from banks. We had the moratorium and all that. Um, so that's that's the other ability, right, that is necessary in, in, in this kind of a situation, which is the ability 
to to find your way yeah amidst uh, lots of um, uncertainty uh, lots of uh, volatility which until today we still face uh, my fellow hr colleagues here will know the chaos that we had uh, last week uh, oh yeah come to office <laughs> or not come to office swap or not swap and and so you know our business continuity was at stake uh, but being able to keep a clear mind, uh, stay composed, because we need to give that clarity uh, to, to, to the yeah. whole organization, right? right. Uh, and there's no playbook to refer to, or the playbook comes in a very uh, confusing, uh, in a very confusing manner, right? Um, so just like uh, Fong Tuan said, the challenge is the mindset, yeah? Um, uh, and agility here is key. We need to embrace the change quickly. Uh, we need to, I don't know, broaden our learning horizon um, and, and provide support huh, for, for the changing circumstances. So, I mean, like you said, it's a lot about mindset. So the staff needs to be agile um, and be, you know, flexible enough to, to jump on the new um, ways of doing work at the moment. Um, so, like, FP, how should companies prepare themselves or their staffs for the new norm of well, oh, I think um, a lot of people say new normal, right? It's the most cliche. If you look for, uh, uh, you know, Google, uh, yeah. new normal, it will be so cliche. Everybody's talking about new normal. I thought the new one is uh, emergency. That's the new one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's another story for another day. It's still very fresh. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, taking the emergency, for example, as a, a case in point, uh, mm. Uh, agility, resilience, uh, adaptability, and flexibility, all these are not new, to be honest. Um, all these capabilities are not new. Uh, it's just that some of these got accelerated and uh, becomes more pertinent in today's very uncertain. Uh, you, have, you have no idea uh, what will happen tomorrow. Uh, you have no idea whether the Prime Minister is going to have another uh, you know, uh, announcement today at 5 p.m. or 8 p.m. or tomorrow or whatever. Every day is new. Um, yeah. So now, the, it's probably not the new normal, I would say the new abnormal. So we are, it's going to be abnormal every day. Uh, you need to have the skills to quickly learn new things very uh, fast. Um, secondly is be comfortable with uncertainty. I think that is uh, something that is very difficult to teach, very difficult to up upskill. Uh, this comfort level with uncertainty is not something that you can just you know, teach over fast. Uh, yeah. It is a, a mindset again, that second. Uh, third is, I think this collaboration between organizations and self, um, the entire paradigm that uh, the employees are thinking, you know, what will company do for me? Uh, how the company will uh, manage my career? That is no longer the case. Um, because going forward, we don't see you technically. We don't engage technically in a physical manner. So a lot of things that happen outside of the Zoom meeting, which is half an hour or an hour, you're on your own. So this ability to self-manage, ability to self-regulate, uh, discipline, mm. create structure for your own self, um, work-life balance is no longer the, uh, the word to use. Not even work-life integration. To me, is how do you avoid work-life confusion? Um, <laughs> That, that is key. Yeah? Uh, I do not want to use why, what C means for MCO. Yeah? C, MCO. Uh, many people say C uh, stands for different, different things. Uh, one of it is we are all very confused sometimes. <laughs> it can be confusion MCO. Uh, the same feeling we get is uh, a lot of our staff are very confused. Uh, you know, communication, uh, steer, direction. They are even confused about you know, what uh, my, my uh, performance objectives are going to be, uh, whether I got a job. In, in, in the future, in the next six months, in the next three months. Um, so this self-regulation, self-discipline uh, is probably something that all of us need to get better at. Um, Cameron, uh, I wanted to talk a bit about, you know, people always say the good old days before COVID has hit us, or people used to say BC. So BC is no longer, um, you know, before crisis actually, before COVID. So what do you think was good about how things were before and how can we then incorporate you know, those things into you know, the work scene today or moving forward? 
I think we just have to really, I, th I guess it all depends on where we are, right? Right now, we're still in the MCO. Um, I think it just, we, they mentioned resilience. So that's some kind of one thing I always think. And people just really need to recognize that, um, that, that it is always going to be constantly changing, right? So in terms of, um, you know, uh, FT was saying, you know, confusion and having to kind of figure out our new, uh, our new way of, uh, training ourselves, right? So I think if people talk a lot of more about like, mental health and things like that nowadays, I think I think it's very easy to sit at your laptop and sit in an office all by yourself all day long. So I think we just really need to be conscious. And when we are out and uh, we are able to get back to the office, I think we do need to um, just get that engagement, right? So for us, one of the things we do um, with the team and things is we have team huddles every week. Like, so just not just having the same kind of meetings, but you know, we actually have like team events, right? So like, I just think people really need to kind of keep doing those things. So those things we probably didn't do as much of those things before, because now you really have to force yourself to, to really be conscious about having those types of um, uh, meaningful interaction that isn't just about a meeting, right? So kind of having, um, just making sure that you're still being able to have normal communications that isn't just all about meetings i think is kind of one of the big things that we try to install at hsbc so yeah that's nice i've actually seen some organizations have lunch together or some teams just have lunch together so they just switch on their cameras and just basically eat and, and chat you know that at least helps to lighten the mood um because usually when you celebrate about something or you had a hard day you can actually tell your team you know what let's go um grab a bite or take some time off uh, for a quick you know something to cheer you up um, or to celebrate but you know with how things are now and you know moving forward we need to innovate on how to do those things and not to lose the personal touch um, so Tameng do you think that work I mean the business of work has basically undergone a revolution or evolution and now it's going to be something totally like it's like this now what can we expect you know after well uh I, I think, to be frank, all this all have already started even before COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, digitalization, the fourth industrial revolution that we all talked about uh, already, uh, have taken place way before even uh, COVID-19 in the last six months. And some of these things have already begun to transform society and the way uh, business is being uh, operated. So, for example, you now hear about new way of doing businesses. You have, uh, you have all this uh, digital economy, you have online business, you have uh, omni-channel marketing, and uh, you have the advent of startups, which happened in the last five or 10 years, you know. Uh, and all these things have, have already started to change the way business used to work. And add to that is uh, the fact that uh, increasingly with technology, people are able to work anywhere. It's no longer a question of the office is by default the place of work. Uh, the office is no longer the default place of work. And there are so many other options available. You can even work in Starbucks for that matter. And uh, of course, uh, work from home is obviously one of the other things. In fact, now as part of our BCM, uh, the whole question of office, uh, we have the office office. We also have the home office. And the home office is now uh, seen as a bona fide uh, alternative in so far as BCM is concerned. And then of course, there's uh, changing social norms uh, with, the chain, uh, with the Gen Y and the Gen Z. The individuality, the flexibility, the desires for you know, uh, doing things differently. Uh, the fact that uh, this younger generation have this sense of shared destiny, shared world that we live in. Uh, shared economy and uh, in fact uh, uh, shared resources so there's that greater sense that why can't we work together why can't we collaborate why must it be I win you lose you know and, and increasingly the younger generation are teaching us that look we don't need to be selfish you know we can work together and be successful together and I think all this has already driven uh, things forward and of course then came COVID-19 and COVID-19 probably moved us forward 10 years uh, uh, and uh, so some of the things that we have already talked about is now already beginning to happen and perhaps uh, forced us to make it happen. So my, what I foresee going forward uh, is that number one, the nature of work has changed. Uh, in the past, uh, we, we, we talk about uh, a lot of work is done by individuals, by um, uh, 
uh, human being, things that are repetitive even, uh, things that are uh, involving a lot of information and data management. Today, all those things that uh, we have taken for granted, say the last 10 years, uh, data, info, uh, calculation, numbers, uh, repetitive work, and uh, even logical thinking, I, I can tell you the machine can do much faster than us. Uh, we know that uh, today, uh, the machine can outsmart the uh, grandmaster and uh, win a chess game. So that that whole thing, the nature of work has shifted us forward. And they say that, all right, we don't need these anymore, frankly. And the future is likely to be, to be that of what we call augmented workforce, where a human being and technology will have to work hand in hand. And uh, what we will, will probably see is that some of these things will be taken over more effectively by AI and by uh, RPA and all those stuff. But what human will need to then focus on are things that we can do that AI cannot take over. For example, uh, this whole area of creativity and creative thinking, uh, where you have that, that creative spark uh, uh, that comes out of nowhere. And that one, the machine cannot take over from you yet. And or similarly, when you talk about innovation or when you talk about uh, uh, having uh, looking and seeing possibilities uh, in a particular scenario. Take a, a, a property developer, for example. He look at a piece of land and he decide that, yes, this is something that worth buying. I see possibility in it. I can assure you, you run this through a machine, they will not be able to make those kind of decisions for you. It is something that you have that gut feel for. Uh, no, those kind of work, no one can take away from human being. Similarly, uh, I would say all those emotive work, where you're talking about EQ, we are talking about uh, learning to read people and uh, also this whole area of relationship and caring and sharing. Now, uh, the machine cannot take over from you just yet. And of course, finally, uh, I think there's this area called, uh, what they call, uh, intuitive uh, uh, nurse, uh, the ability to think, uh, have insight, uh, and uh, making judgment call uh, and having wisdom. Those are things that, at this point in time at least, uh, even if you have fuzzy logic and so on, I don't think machine can take over those things. So the nature of work will change. There are certain things that people, human beings can do better and we should focus on those things. Type of work will change. Uh, if you look at the kind of work that we have today, 10 years ago, does not exist. So for example, you say, uh, today you have this thing called social media manager. Uh, yeah. days, never heard of it before, right? Or what you call big data analyst or what you call uh, uh, cloud service specialist, uh, these things does not exist in the past. Today, they are already here. And I can assure you, give and take another five years, uh, you're going to have new terms like uh, social media ethics. Right? How do you create ethics uh, in the social media world? Or for that matter, human technology integrators. Or uh, you might even have this AI cultural coach. Uh, I, I like that one. I, I expect that one day, somebody will come out and say, you need to train AI to learn to be more culturally attuned, say right thing and do right thing, you know, and uh, uh, somebody has to coach AI to do all these things. So these will be the future jobs. I think the type of work will change. And finally, the organization of work will change. Uh, it's, uh, most definitely, organization of the future is not going to be a hierarchy, but platforms. And uh, basically, work will be to enable, or organizations will be to enable collaboration by way of a platform. And you are going to see increasingly, not only just full-time employee, but also part-time employees, and also what we call uh, freelancers and uh, outsourced employees. And we will have to make use of all these different type of work, uh, workforce uh, to get ourselves more efficient and more effective. Uh, most definitely, organizations are also thinking how to reduce costs. Instead of hiring full-time, can I outsource this to some other people to do? Can I get freelancers to do it for me? And then they don't become part of my headcount and part of my overhead. Um, thank you, Tatming. I think a lot of what you said, it's about, you know, uh, robots taking over the world, you know, and they're taking over our jobs and things like that. So, uh, Iskandar, maybe you can share a bit about how, you know, how will all of this influence the working styles of the future? How can someone now, you know, like Tatming was sharing, use this to our advantage, um, and especially in the banking sector where, you know, everything is now online. Um, how has that affected people's working styles? Hmm. Yeah. So like uh, like Tang Ming said, the digitalization, the automation, the AI part, the robotics is already here. Yeah? As we speak, some of the uh, report generation and all this is already 
uh, being taken over by 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 RPA. So um, you know uh, the I think what we require are minds that can create um, solutions. Yeah, the 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 creative part, uh, like what uh, Tameng was saying. Yeah, uh, and in order to do so, they must uh, really understand what is the circumstance or the the situation that the customer needs. Then uh, we need someone who can solve them, right? And I think in order to do so, it also requires those who are um, bold enough, yeah, uh, to do things a bit differently, not be bound by the things that you know, um, the the things that you and I have been used to. Uh, you and I will come up with the same solutions uh, that may not solve the problem for the future, right? Um, so, you know, um, in order for us to not be outdone by the machine, um, we need to swim upstream yeah, to something of uh, higher value in terms of uh, roles and skills, right? Like, like I mean, said, the repetitive work is already being taken over by the machine, right? Um, so then the other, the other part is uh, how effective, you know, the person who is effective working in this uh, virtual environment is the person that will thrive, I believe, right? Uh, you can be anywhere and uh, still be able to deliver your work, which means as an organization, I'm then, um, I, I now have the ability to leverage talent from anywhere. I'm not bound to somebody who can only come and work in Manaro Bank Islam, for example, right? Uh, now my, my, my pool of talent can come from somebody who is sitting in a different state. And I don't even need to bring this person to come and sit in KL. I can even uh, have the talent to work in another country uh, if that's where the skill is, right? Um, you know, when otherwise we would have typically uh, recruited somebody who is in Klang Valley, for example, to do a role that is in in, in, in another, another bank stuff. So, you know, it's, it's about the skills and it's about the ability to innovate uh, and immerse yourself in what the customer needs and 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 be able to uh, provide that solution yeah um thank you i mean with what you you said it um we hear a lot about the whole phrase gig economy i think you touched a bit about it as well um so what do you make out of that you know like you said someone could be working for you but not necessarily within clan valley in fact that person could even be in uk or anywhere indonesia and they could or still canada or Canada, um, or servicing the organization. Um, but yeah, so what do you make out of it? And do you think this will be a big part of how we move forward? Uh, me, Iskandar, to answer? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so gig economy. Um, so I, I term it as uh, uh, as and when required, lah, right? Um, so we uh, basically engage the, the resource um, you know, um, based on necessity. Uh, and this is uh, quite different to how we have traditionally been operating, uh, Bank Islam included. Um, you know, in, in uh, right until today, Poon, I think we are still, you know, uh, in, in a typical way where if there is a job to be done, uh, you know, we tend to recruit somebody on payroll, a salary with uh, typically with some uh, benefits and, you know, Obviously, there is a cost, uh, and, and that cost will increase every year. Um, inevitably, yeah, um, the this the rise in gig economy has sort of like encouraged organizations, yeah, to relook at their workforce strategies. Um, you know, uh, large companies have already started work on this. Uh, Bank Islam included. You know, instead of hiring uh, on permanent, we move towards more uh, professional uh, skill uh, contractors. Yeah. So that uh, we can tap into a more specialized pool. Yeah. At the same time, we we remain uh, agile. Yeah. We can we can quickly uh, change the, the you know uh, the workforce uh, as as we need. Yeah. So I, I think it's you know the gig economy is going to be the way forward. Yeah. It gives us the flexibility. It gives us the agility, especially in terms of uh, skills and in terms of uh, cost. Um, even for the individual who is um, you know, providing that, that, that service or that skill, um, I think it's a bit more exciting, right? Rather than you being bound to um, one particular um, institution or organization, 
you have uh, you can serve a, a wider crowd and you can do multiple things uh, at one go uh, instead of just being uh, bound to your day job uh, and you know in this in this crisis situation i think the gig economy is also the fastest way for someone to rebound yeah to start earning an income uh, for those who unfortunately mm. uh, lost their jobs right mm. so i think it's a good evolution yeah, yeah. It's quite entrepreneurial for someone to get into it as well, because basically you are your own organization. How do you brand yourself, your skills, and things like that? Um, Cameron, I wanted to ask, uh, what would you say is the benefit for the gig economy for your, you know, organizations? And are you already practicing it um, in the back? Or I would say we're probably a bit behind uh, when it comes to that. But I guess when you think about the gig economy, um, you know, it really is really picking up over the last number of years. Um, I was looking up some stats before the, the meeting and they say in Malaysia, it, uh, it, the gig economy expanded 30, 31% since 2017. So, you know, and it's got age bracket of 25 to 35 is kind of where they say a lot of the people. So it, I think being one of the, you know, older, older generation, I suppose, um, you know, it, it's something that, you know, makes sense to me, you know, like, I mean, wouldn't want to be like a freelancer, right? Like this sounds, this sounds cool too. Um, and you know, this, it's, uh, it's the flexibility, I think, and the agile and the sub, it is really the, the keys for, for the individual. And, and for an organization, like, like it's already been said, you know, they're not locked into that type of role. So yeah, I, I agree with the, with the other speakers that it's just going to continue to get bigger and bigger. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, we, we do have contingent workers, if you will. I mean, we do have less, I guess we do hire more um, uh, contractors now, if you will, uh, than possibly we had in the, in the past, right? Um, and now with attrition as low as it is in all organizations because of, of COVID. So, yeah, I just think it's just going to, you know, you're going to have online workers, you know, all these independent contractors. So I think it's just, it's not going to go away. It's just going to become bigger and bigger, and it's just going to grow with the generation. Can yeah. I jump in with one comment? Uh, sure. uh, on the opposite end of it, I think you need to be mindful that with increasing dependency of on gig economy or freelancers, uh, the risk is uh, what is the impact on culture, for example. Uh, how will organizations, uh, especially when you want to build a certain culture and certain value system, how do you get people to become committed to those kind of values when they're not even your employees in the first place? They say, I'm a freelancer. I really don't belong to you. And uh, you can do what you want. I, there's nothing that should uh, control me in any way, right? So I, I think that's going to be a challenge, uh, how organization will continue to maintain or, or enhance the culture that they have. Uh, yeah. Then the question of commitment. Uh, I'm not an employee. So where's my loyalty? My loyalty is to me. Why should I care what you are concerned about? As long as I deliver good quality, I give you the best uh, in terms of my understanding of what best is, that's good enough. I, I don't really need to be loyal to the organization or say good things about the organization. There's no, no need for me to say, stay or strive for the organization. You know? And I, I think that could potentially become another challenge to, uh, that we may face uh, with this new so-called gig economy thing. Uh, what about collaboration? How do I work closely with people who are in the office who are FTEs? And I'm a, I'm a freelancer. I, I have no status. I'm just delivering you a piece of thing. Uh, why should I collaborate with you to do a little bit more? Why should I go one, uh, one mile, uh, uh, carry it for another mile? Or why should I go the extra mile for you? Uh, I, I, I suspect that this could become some of the challenges uh, that uh, we may face when we talk about gig economy and how are we going to make this work between an organized uh, context versus a, a informal context? Ooh. I think there's a lot more that needs to be, you know, thought through about this topic because it's, you know, like, so, you know, my next question to FT, do you think the gig economy is for everyone? Like, especially for someone starting out, you know, like if I've been trying to look for a job, it's been a year, at what point should I then decide maybe I should jump into this gig economy? Is it for me? Then discipline comes in again. Um, you know, what are your thoughts, FT? Um, let me allude to, you know, Tatming's uh, point. Um, I think the risk is real uh, for us in Zadzong because 40% of our roles are actually 
not gig gig per se. I think what that meant was a full time freelance gig, one two months, three months, six months. Uh, uh the forty percent that I have, they are fixed term contracts, but not more than one year. Ah, uh, those are contingent workers, lah. Correct, correct. Immediately, I already have a problem of alignment. Yeah. Um, uh, well, they probably committed because they are paid to be committed, and they are trying to get still in their mindset is I'm trying to get to become a permanent. Uh, because that is the end end goal. Uh, because mm. that the the context of success is you are in a permanent role. I yep. think that will change as well. Um, more and more uh, organizations, uh, banks, it's probably a bit more difficult because now you still got a lot of unions that to, that you need to manage. Uh, but uh, Samsung has moved into this uh, contingent. Uh, almost we'll, we are moving to fifty fifty in the next uh, one to two years. Um, the challenge is this: number one, alignment. Commitment is definitely right. Uh, building culture and how do you capabilize these guys? Uh, when in terms of ROI, you teach them, you train them, and then they move on to your competitor because they can move to competitors. Yeah, because that is a free market. So this is something that we need to you know grapple with and and uh, come up with a, some some sort of solution from a structural perspective. Um, just by just saying it, it will happen, and not doing anything to ensure that we are prepared for it is not going. Not going to work. Um, from a perspective of you know, uh, you know, now that you're asking me uh, whether if you are starting out new and so on. Um, well, firstly, is we need to change the mindset, the young ones, uh, particularly this year, because apart from banks, uh, some of the bigger banks I know, uh, Maybank for example, is continuing to hire because of you know natural uh, national service anyway. I'm not. I'm not sure whether Bank Islam is continuing to hire in droves. Uh, UOB, yeah. I'm sure, is pretty vigilant in certain areas and a bit more selective. Uh, people yeah. like us, we don't have such national service that I need to. So the first thing I need to be worried about is ensuring that my uh, the the workforce that I have is fit for the purpose. Secondly, it is still from a cost perspective we we need to manage, uh, which is why contingent becomes the go to. Right, one year, and and they are easier to manage uh, than a, a, a full time equivalent. So for the young ones, if you are starting up now and you find it difficult and a challenge to find full time, good thing is everyone else who is not hiring full time, they need people as well. They need uh, they they need people to prepare for the rebound. Uh, this is when they bring in people to do you know short term projects. Uh, the BAUs are done by the full time equivalent. But new projects, you know, come to come up with uh, new areas that uh, we are preparing to go into in next year, in the next couple of years, we have we have projects, um, and those are normally crewed by consultants, uh, freelancers, people with uh, ability to look at different things uh, at at different time uh, that you are not uh, governed by certain rules, uh, and you are not you don't need to follow any specific uh, guidance from headquarters. This is the best time to do it. So yeah. you know, for the young ones, uh, and uh, you are just starting out, you don't get a job anyway. So I don't even mind if you take internship. Uh, going yeah. forward, I think internship yeah. in America and yeah. in South America would be very different from internship here. Internship here is they are just you know arranging tables and chairs, you know, doing menial jobs. But there are full time interns. Full time interns. I know it's a an oxymoronic thing to say. Full time interning. <laughs> in in North America, you actually have people interning for three, four, five years in seven, eight different organizations, learning yeah. new things because they say, I don't want to be a full time uh, employee yet. But I'm not a freelancer. I I go in there. I intern. Uh, sometimes I intern for six months. Sometimes I intern for one year. Um. So you know, guys, if uh the Graduates or soon to be graduates, yeah, don't fret. Uh, times are difficult. Yes, uh, you have a lot of HR directors here. Uh, some of them are looking for people, but I guarantee you, all of us are looking for good people. Yeah, regardless of what job we have, uh, don't be too fussy. Uh, all jobs you will learn, so you will learn and you will grow anyway. So don't think that I need to be a full time equivalent. I need to be in a proper regular job. To be successful, you can be successful regardless. Yeah, certainly want to echo what Fong Tuan has just said. It is going to be unfortunate for many of you graduating. 
the days when we are hiring in droves, uh, not, not for this next two years at least, I don't see us hiring in droves. I'm not sure about HSBC, but definitely not in UOB. Uh, we will be hiring, but rather selectively. And how are you going to be able to make a uh, to convince someone that you are worth hiring as a full-time employee? Well, take whatever that comes along, show that you can do the job. If you are brought in as a contingent worker, a part-timer or a, a fixed-term contract or even an outs outsourced third-party employee, take it. Don't think that it's a waste of time. Take it, learn. Take the opportunity to see how you can gain as much experience as you can. Even if they say put you on a what we call an F-step program in the bank, we have this thing called F-step, which is actually a temporary six, eight, uh, 12 month training to allow you to learn about banking. Take it, uh, don't, don't see this as a waste of time. Any learning opportunity, uh, any working experience add on to your CV and that will make you a more competent person and also will make your CV more colorful and interesting. So go ahead, don't yeah. be choosy. Yeah, and I think it's I think you've both said it, but it's really with the desire to keep learning, right? That that's that's what that's kind of the future skills. You know, we we use the term future skills a lot at HSBC, but it really is about a data mindset, and I think it's about you know presentation skills. Still, I still think project management. So, all of those are kind of the key skills that you, like you say, get in the door and, and just keep working towards that. But the desire to keep learning, that's that's kind of a key thing nowadays, right? Like it's 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 kind of how how you can apply and keep keep learning because it's always going to be changing, right? So we talk about agile and all of that a lot today. But um, so I think those are some pretty pretty important types of skills um, that you know are always going to be in demand, right? In in that uh, in the communication skills. And the first step through the door is always a better thing to do rather than right. to hopefully get through completely. Get one foot through the door. Uh, thank you. So we've been receiving a lot of questions actually from, from the floor and I think they've taken up from whatever uh, you know, we were talking about. And so one question came from Logan which said that how would then a company ensure that interns are being trained properly and gaining the necessary experience while you know, everyone's working online? Uh, it's kind of maybe you can take this one. Is how, how, sorry, how the question is how interns can can, can ensure the interns are being trained properly and gaining the necessary experience. When mm. others are working online. Yeah, yeah. when everyone's online and they need more guidance and that's where they get lost. Yeah. yeah. I, I had this tricky situation in Bank Islam because we onboarded, uh, um, we had the intake for our graduate program, um, which uh, interestingly coincided with, um, with the start of the uh, CMCO. Uh, recently um, and so you know um, initially we were also uh, a bit unsure do we what do we do I mean do we get them to the office no one's there uh, you know how, how do we how do we get them to learn but so we thought you know uh, this is then also a perfect opportunity to get them used to uh, a different style of working right so we converted that one initial one week of uh, 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 onboarding training to, to a virtual setup, I addressed them and I said, look, when the situation changes, we change, right? We must be able to uh, reshuffle quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I had I had uh, business heads who were a bit concerned, do I receive this uh, new new joiner now or can you postpone it? HR, can you postpone it? Uh, no, I said, we're not going to postpone it uh, and we will guide you, you know? So, the, 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 that, that, you know, whether it is a face-to-face -face or, or uh, being done virtually, the, the intent is uh, to communicate, uh, to engage, right? Um, so even if it was a, uh, if, even if it was done physically, but we didn't do enough to communicate and to engage, we may not, we may not have passed it on because I do uh, unfortunately see instances of intern just, interns just being left in the corner. And I think that's, that's a complete waste of uh, the, the opportunity uh, for the person to learn, um, but yeah, I think uh, the, the the learning uh, must still continue. Uh, so be it, even if it's uh, if it's done virtually. Defining clear objectives is kind of you know clear, measurable objectives is going to be key, and and it's the very same with HSBC mm -hmm. and, and our interns or graduate programs. You know, can we just postpone them? And we just can't. You had to. You know, it was a great opportunity um, to 
engage them in a different way, working with our managers in a different way. Um, and you know what, we've been getting a lot of great feedback from, from managers and from the students in terms of how it is working. So, you know, everyone's kind of in front of their laptop all the time, whether you're using Jabber or whatever, instant messaging or, um, so I think that it's just, uh, the managers having to be available, right? Available and really, you know, having, having good conversations and setting those clear objectives is key. And then how are you measuring them and checking in on them and things like that. So, um, we're all doing it right so we're all like like so it's it's doable um but yeah it was definitely it was you know to kind of take a step back and think how are we going to define these now for for the students so it's a great question it's i think it's, assigning mentors or buddies would be helpful yeah. Uh, yeah if you if you are going to be virtual then make sure that the person who comes on board after the virtual onboarding like what iskanda said then make sure that you assigned a mentor or buddy to this person and make sure that the buddy guide that person uh, on a regular basis, step to step, uh, step by step, and also have lots of communication, uh, phone or otherwise. Uh, that probably will help mitigate the, the missing element called camaraderie, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, these are the batch of people who need to learn what Agile is from day one, basically, right? When they yeah. come in, the world has changed. And I mean, they are the generation that has gone through so many different changes. So it's just something that they should take in their stride and continue. In fact, it would be a blessing, in fact, if they could have different mentors and learn from different people because now it's virtual. So they can learn from even more people, if anything. Um, we're actually at our last question. We received a question. I think this is for all of you just before we wrap up because you've shared a lot of advice about how someone can, you know, key takeaways for them about how as a graduate, how do they move forward and, you know, what have they should learn from the, the crisis, but they want to now know what were your key learnings actually. So they're throwing it back to the panel. They're saying that um, what were your key learnings from you know the crisis, both from a business and a leadership point of view. So as a leader, you know, what did you learn? Um, FT, maybe you can start. Okay. Uh, well, I've learned a lot, um, and I also unlearned a lot. So the question is. Uh, we need to unlearn many things that we have known to be truth, or at least seemingly uh, the truth. Uh, examples uh, can be, well, um, you need to communicate. And when you communicate, you need to be genuine and authentic. And those are not normally done in the context of, you know, seeing people, person, the person face to face, looking them in the eye, uh, and then uh, you communicate uh, so that the other person understand. Um, I think that uh, I've, learn how to do that without having uh, the opportunity to meet up with that person. Um, secondly, uh, the need to gather consensus to ensure that you, know, you make uh, the best decision by getting, uh, gathering all the inputs. Uh, that's probably still the same, but how we do it has also changed. Uh, we need to rely a lot more on data, a lot more, a lot more on uh, evidence and proof points, uh, rather than a lot of uh, sound bites, uh, where previously you can just walk around, you know, like Cameron say, uh, you can just walk uh, from, from meetings and then just asking, you know, what do you think? Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, is you can't just call people whenever you like to, because you need to schedule Zoom calls. Uh, you can't just, you know, I, I have something in my mind, I, I just want to get this done. Uh, so that's something I need to unlearn as well. Um, what I've learned the most is, there is nothing more important than people in a business. So protecting our people is the number one thing. Uh, all the strategies in the world will not be successful. All the tactics, all the business plans will not work suddenly because we all defeated by a very microscopic opponent. This little bug technically just drove down industries and economies to their knees. Um, because we were not prepared. Uh, if this happened again, we probably will relearn some of this stuff, but certainly we would not be unprepared again. So that is something that uh, I've learned. Uh, personally, I think balance is something that I take for granted. That is something that I've learned as well. Um, I don't know whether the rest of you have uh, issues. I'm sure Tuck Ming and Iskandar may have this issue. Uh, not you, as in the company. 
organization have these issues. Um, previously, everyone wants to go work from home 100%. Now that they are working 100% from home, uh, it's their first time in their life that they are spending so much time with their loved ones that some of them become <laughs> unloved because having to <clears throat> face your spouse, I mean, Tatmi has been married for a long time, and I know I have been as well. Um, it's the first time in our lives that we have to spend 24 7, day in, day out, particularly during MCO time, lockdown, day in, day out. You've got to cook in there, you've got to you know, do everything, whatever that you do. Uh, you don't have, you know, your wife can't send you away for uh, 10 hours and then come back and then you speak for an hour and then you go to bed. It's <laughs> full, full time at, at home. So the health of uh, the unit, the family unit, uh, is something that I learned as well. Learning how to balance this, learning how to manage the different priorities um, is something that uh, I personally have learned. And uh, I think I appreciate uh, this learning a lot. So that's something that I'm That's nice. Uh, Tami, what about you? You know, I, I never wrote so much in my whole 35 years HR career. Uh, the only way to keep in touch with my, and my colleagues, the 5,000 plus of them, is by way of, unfortunately, we are a bit backward here. We have email. That's the only thing. And one of the things that came through to me, the realization that I had was that uh, actually employees need to feel that they are, they, they are aware of what's going on, that the leadership has clarity uh, what they are doing. The leadership is on top of things, uh, that they are very calm and collected and they're in control. And they need to feel that kind of assurance from the top. And they also need to feel that their leadership care about them. And so what, one of the things I, I learned to do in this uh, last six, seven months, starting from March 18, is to, to write and uh, to write uh, short articles, uh, almost essentially like blogging, uh, sharing about things yeah, and not necessarily work related. It can be more philosophical or more, more personal in nature and especially those that are more personal. And uh, helping them to see uh, that, that, that things are not so bad and uh, we're all going through things together and giving them a different perspective uh, and so on and so forth. And I, 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 I never realized that I could do that. I mean, I always thought that I'm a very factual, very a science guy, you know. So, and and uh, someone going, said this to me, actually it was my wife who said this to me. You know, you are like a chaplain to your, your people now. You are there to hold their hand and to keep them uh, steady on, you know, so that they don't, they don't panic. And it's your job to make sure that they feel that way. And so I, I did a lot of writing, uh, a lot of uh, uh, very from the heart type of writing. In fact, uh, uh, during that period when uh, in the initial bit, it was more getting things sorted, you know, what you need to know, uh, what kind of, uh, a system they need to be using, how do you, how do you, what, what you can claim, what you can't claim. Then it move on to uh, encouraging them to be resilient. Don't give up. Uh, we are all together here. Those who work in office, you have their own, they have the same, a different set of challenges. Those who are asked to stay at home, like what Fong Tuan say, they have a completely different set of challenges. Uh, having to stay with their family, their wives, their children, the, or their husband and their spouse and the, and the children, it's not easy. And, and, then, and then how do you become not only just uh, uh, surviving, how do you thrive in that environment? How can you continue to be uh, able to deliver good results? So we, we, that was the next phase. And then finally, we talked about the recovery. Uh, as they start to move back to office, what, what are the encouragement I need to give them and the challenges? And that was something that I, I found uh, quite amazing about uh, because uh, it employees actually responded very positively to this kind of uh, support. And uh, uh, when we did our employee engagement survey recently, uh, it was quite amazing uh, to hear from them, uh, their own feedback to us, uh, the management, that, hey, thank you, you guys did very well. These are some of the things we really needed and you gave us that support at that time. So one of the major lessons I learned uh, is, is that 
uh, human being, uh, especially in times of crisis, is in need of crisis leadership. And this leadership must provide calmness, clarity, care and concern, compassionate, uh, and uh, they are able to be, they are actually uh, seen to be in control of things. And when they have that assurance, then they're able to do their job and uh, with that comfort that no worry, whatever come, they are on top of things. And that helped them tremendously. I, I, I thought it was uh, wonderful. I, I, I think it was, a, it was an experience for me. Uh, all my 35 years of working life as a HR person, I've never had something like that. And uh, I, I must say, uh, uh, it was a humbling experience in that sense. Cameron, maybe you can share your experience, some key learnings. Yeah, I think I think for my team, it was really about empowerment and making sure that people were really, um, everyone was bought into what we were trying to do, right? So everyone everyone played a key role at some point on, you know, everyone owned a bit of our process that we were changing, so to speak. So I think for me, it was really about empowerment and that's leaders, my people who I look up to as leaders, They've that's always been a big thing. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the biggest part for me was just really getting getting the team all bought in, um, common common objectives, and uh, and then like I say, empowering them to to do them and supporting them. I, I agree with uh, what's been said here. I mean, really, people um, people want to be heard. They want to be you know they 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 they're not they, they definitely want to be part of the solution. So I think that to me was the, the biggest. Um, takeaways and again, just the result, the resiliency of the team. It's just, it, it's been amazing. So it's been, it's been probably the toughest year for all of us in our careers. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's been the most rewarding too. And and really, that's all about the team that I have. So yeah. Iskandar, maybe you can share a bit about your key learnings as well. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so for me, um, I think we can only plan so much. But the chaos that comes each day, uh, you know, can can catch you off guard and and you know um, throw throw your plans uh, down the drain altogether. So the the important uh, ability there is to you know be able to quickly um, you know shift uh, and 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 keep going. Um, and the other part that I learned, uh, you know, is the absolute need for a lot of communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and like uh, my my colleagues have mentioned here, um, they look for clarity, they look for direction, they look for assurance, and that can only come when uh, when the leadership is is communicating enough. Uh, at Bank Islam, we we have our um, internal uh, social media platform, and that helps uh, many of the leaders to to reach out. Uh, so uh, at the at the center. Uh, wherever we sit, I can I can easily now say hi to to someone who is sitting in a branch in 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 Sarawak, for example, uh, and that's nice, you know. And and they can they can feel that that link, or my CEO can say something out there, or they can they can they can they can reach out. Um, so that ability to to connect uh, and and you know that gives that kind of uh, assurance, that feeling of uh, engagement uh, to to stay together. Um, especially in, in, in difficult times. Uh, the other, the last point that I wanted to touch on is in terms of mental, emotional resilience. Mm. I think when the uh, crisis first struck, um, you know, we were not sure how to move. Um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, conflicting information. There was demand. How do you set up your moratorium, for example? Um, you know, maybe some information was not forthcoming yet. So, you know, suddenly it put people into a very uh, high stressed um, uh, environment. People were working at home. They didn't have access to all the information that they needed. Um, people were, in a way, stretched, were working until into wee hours of the night, uh, multiple back to back online meetings. So, that needed a lot of uh, mental, emotional resilience. Uh, and I think it's, it's probably tougher for those uh, out there who uh, may have uh, been uh, financially impacted or had their jobs lost, you know. So I think I think it's tougher out there. Uh, but essentially, you know, the ability to 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 withstand the the, the turbulence uh, mentally and emotionally. And so that's also for me. What kind of support as an organization? What kind of support do we give um, to to our colleagues, uh, especially those who are on the front line? You know, uh, there was a bit of a 
noise, you know, hey, we are still open, you guys are working from home, um, you know, our, our lives less uh, important than, than you guys, you know, so all this kind of, uh, and this is real, this is, these are the real emotions and feelings that are coming through, which it's easy for us to take for granted, um, and, and that's a very key lesson uh, for me, thank you. Thank you. Everyone's scared, you know, it's hitting everyone from every corner and so it yeah. brings a lot of doubt and questions. So it's important that the leadership makes it, makes things clear, uh, like what you mentioned earlier. So I wanted to say thank you so much uh, to all our panelists. I think all of you gave very, very important and honest insights, which you know is always nice to hear for someone, whether they're young or looking for a career or anything like that, because at least they get to learn a bit from your experience. So I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, so for everyone else, um, please join us for our next session which is about pros and cons of a virtual career um, which will be starting soon so thank you everybody thank you, thank you. Two, three, four, eight.